Hey, it's midnight. What's up? It's the Culture Detective here investigating your favorite albums. And today, um, I'm so close to getting 2,000 subscribers. Please subscribe to me because once we hit 2,000 subscribers, I will probably, hopefully, maybe if I have time, release my first video essay. But today, I'm going to be doing something a little bit special, and that is a classic review. Yay! Wait, 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 hold on, just before I continue this review, I need to say something, this video is sponsored by Nuke Syndrome, look at this guy, do you think he's ugly, do you think he's stupid, well, if you do, don't worry, because now you can go to www.nukesyndrome.com where you can send a nuke to Little Syndrome's house and blow him up. Just use code DETECTIVE, D-E-T-E-C-T-I-V-E. -E -E. Then you'll get your nuke free. You can nuke this guy for free. Hey, so I'm continuing with my classic album review series with the third album. And this album is an album that I've been quite excited to talk about. And that is, of course, King Crimson's In the Court of the Crimson King. So yeah, finally I'm talking about this album. This is a classic cue in the memes. Um, of course, if you're a fan of JoJo, you would know King Crimson, but really, even if you're not a fan of JoJo, and if you're uh, a, a fan of music in general, uh, particularly prog rock, you have to have heard of King Crimson. Crimson. Even if you haven't heard of them, you have to have at least seen this album cover. This is one of the most iconic album covers ever, and honestly, one of my favorites of all times as well. It's just one of those album covers where when you look past it, you're like, wait, hold on. You need a second look because it's just so provocative, and I just really love that. But um, yeah, anyways, London, Prague, Rock, Legends, King Crimson. This is their debut album released in the year 1969. This is before Dark Side of the Moon is released. This is before Led Zeppelin 4 was released. This is way before so many great music. It is old, but yet it's so damn good. So, the man who, uh, I guess, uh, fronted this band, or uh, was the most prominent member of this band, is Robert Fripp. He and four other people formed King Crimson. And after the release of this album, um, they sort of parted ways, and this band constantly changed and shifted, and the members sort of come and go. But in the center of this band, we have multi-instrumentalist and vocalist, I believe, Robert Fripp as well as Peter Sinfield, who is the reason behind these majestic lyrics. And anyways, we have this album, and it's kind of concept album in a way, but also not. And I say in a way is because this album is unlike your average prog rock album of the late 60s. This is around the time where a lot of amazing and legendary American and British prog rock albums start to pop up left and right. It is a huge movement, also a huge movement in terms of the counterculture, the culture against the establishment uh, in the wake of the Vietnam War. A lot of bands like Can and Yes and Pink Floyd were up and coming. In fact, Can released their debut album in 69. Yes released their debut album in 69. And I believe around the same time, Pink Floyd just released Adam Hart Mother. So yeah, However, still, one of the most exciting, new, innovative bands to come out of this era is King Crimson because they have such a bold and cinematic approach to prog rock. And at the same time, they experiment so much. It is actually extremely interesting and very ahead of its time. This album is 42 minutes long and it's only five tracks, but almost every single track here is humongous. The first three tracks make up of side A, and the last two tracks made up of side B. And again, if you know vinyls, you know, side A, you flip it around, it's side B. So the album opens off with 21st century schizoid man. 
And um, again, if you if you haven't heard of King Crimson before, but you know Kanye West, you would probably know his song Power. Well, Power directly, very blatantly samples 21st century schizoid man. 21st century schizoid man. Bam, 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 bam. This is absolutely insane. An absolutely insane album opener. And this track is probably the only quote unquote banger of the entire album. But as far as bangers go, this is uh, as great as it can be as a prog rock banger. It is loud, crazy, and it has these big, bold drum fills on top of these really raw, rough guitar riffs, muffled, crazy, shouty vocals, and all of these melds together and spirals into insanity, turning into wild guitar leads and saxophones. After the main choruses, or I guess vocal parts, we have this jazzy improv session that is so fiery and wild and unhinged. It's amazing. Now we have the lyrics where Peter, Peter Sinfield, uh, the man behind the lyrics, of course, writes about the Vietnam War. We have a lot of imagery of napalm fire, barbed wire, children bleeding. It's all very uh, provocative and the live performance of 21st century schizoid man especially in Hyde Park London is insanely iconic and this is definitely one of the most important tracks in rock music history even though it's not even my favorite on the entire album but of course after something so rough and fiery and insane this is immediately contrasted with something sweet Folky with I Talk to the Wind, which is the shortest track on the entire album and also the least ambitious. But even so, this is a beautiful, elegant folk song that is also at the same time kind of jazzy. It's very dreamy and hypnotic. We have some intoxicating flutes. And also band member Ian McDonald uses a mellotron, which is a, uh, a musical instrument that I'm not super familiar with, but that thing creates some very gorgeous notes on this track and overall it is a beautiful follow-up to 21st century schizoid man afterwards we have the track epitaph including march for no reason and tomorrow and tomorrow also a lot of these track titles feel almost like um chapters from a book but uh, abridged so it's like a 21st century schizoid man including mirrors um, and then a little bit later, uh, all the tracks have, you know, including this, including that. And it's so cool. They're doing it just because it's cool. They're doing it just to show off. They're performing music in 5-8 time signature, 7-8 time signature with very weird chord progressions just to show off. But that is cool because that is taking music to a next level. That is saying, hey, music doesn't have to be poppy and fun and crowd pleasing. We can make it weird as hell because it's art. So yeah, Epitaph is my favorite track off of the album and slowly becoming uh, one of my favorite songs ever. Um, probably in my top 20 or top 30 favorite songs ever. I haven't really given a lot of thought to, uh, to what my favorite songs are, but Epitaph is definitely up there because this is a hell of a cinematic piece of music. It's so atmospheric and moody. When I listen to this song, I feel like a weary traveler trekking through a dangerous land. It's very deep and haunting, and it's so orchestral, yet the guitars and the drums and the entire presentation of the track feel so big and bold. I feel like I'm slowly dying or slowly entering the gates of hell, and the crescendos are so epic and sad and destructive and slow, and the guitar chords are so smoky and lonesome. It's honestly just transports you to the face of death, and it's crazy. Um, yeah, right from the off of the bat, we have the orchestral opening with the really dense drum rolls and uh, the very theatrical melody performance building up to choruses that just feel like sad 
left out afterwards, but immediately builds to instrumental sections. This is where you'll find March for No Reason in Tomorrow and Tomorrow, which is at the end of the track, and it's just um the the line and confusion will be my epitaph. It's just so Oh my god. And and the lyrics continue. Knowledge is a deadly friend if no one sets the rules. The fate of all mankind, I see, is in the hand of fools. And it's so... Oh. And the last few minutes get so heavy and thick. It's crazy. I am in love with this track. This is insane. So side A ends off on an extremely high note. And honestly, side B is just as spectacular. We have Moonchild, including the dream and the illusion. It's essentially a 12 minute long track, but really the dream is two minutes long and the illusion is 10 minutes long. This track starts off as a sad, somber guitar ballad uh, about a moon child, which is apparently um, based off of a character from a novel written by British occultist Alistair Crowley. But yeah, it is kind of eerie, forlorn, and then it just abruptly ends. And the next 10 minutes of the track is nothing. It's just an ambient track. It's spacey, and it's an empty soundscape. We have some keyboards here, it plays around, some vibraphones here, very light taps on the cymbals. And it's all like the band members turned into musical instruments and they're having a conversation for 10 minutes. It's extremely interesting. And yeah, usually random spacey moments in albums may put people off. A, I like that as an artistic expression. B, I see this as a way they're going against the, I guess, traditional, you know, every single song has to be a banger, has to be poppy and catchy kind of formula. Around the same time, the Beatles have already been experimenting a little, just a tad bit in their music on albums like Revolver and The White Album and also Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Heart Club's band. Um, and also, I think in the year 69, they also released Abbey Road. And uh, the second half of that album is one big crazy experimentation, in my opinion. But this, this is insane. This is cinematic. And I really appreciate that. Now we have the ending of uh, the album in the Court of the Crimson King, which I believe is uh, only 10 minutes, but it's still the second longest track on the entire album. And it includes the Return of the Fire Witch and the Dance of the Puppets. And yeah, this is a big, bold, epic ending. Just like Epitaph, it is insanely epic and grandiose. I sound, It sounds like I'm slowly descending into hell because the instruments are so hot and fiery and, and it's like lava. And then we have these vocal harmonies that just uh, feel like biblical chants ascending keyboards so that we go back from the top of the hook and then we go down again. Uh, and it's just, it's like the end of the world. And then we have the storytelling where uh, we have entered the court of the Crimson King, and the Crimson King is this really menacing figure. And they're summoning a fire witch to the court of the Crimson King. And it's... <laughs> it's crazy. It's um, the Black Queen chants the funeral march. The cracked brass bells will ring. It's... It's really illustrative, and the ending is chaotic and noisy and brings everything to an epic ending. So, as you can probably tell, I love this album. But what I like even more is that it is a debut album, and to start off your band discography with something this ambitious is wild. But the band will go on and try all sorts of musical genres in the rock spectrum later on in their careers, and they're all very iconic. But it is this album that really, really is a hallmark for musical history. So yeah, this is amazing. It's a masterpiece. And uh, if you haven't listened to it, what are you doing, bro? What are you doing? This album, uh, King Crimson's in the court of the Crimson King deserves a 10 out of 10. So have you listened to this album? Comments below, let me know. Subscribe if you want more, and thanks for watching.